The 2022 ACT just got released today, so I'm going to go ahead and take you guys through the five hardest questions from this test. Also, make sure you watch till the end and pay attention for any text that pops up on the screen because I promise there's going to be something there that you don't want to miss. Now, let's go ahead and get started with the first question. Question 30 was a real stumper for students. It says, next month at a pet uh, food trade show, Pet Snacks will exhibit one box of each flavor of its entire line of pet treats in a row on the shelf. By that time, the company will have added three different flavors of durable treats to its line of pet treats. Which of the following computations gives the number of additional orders in which Pet Snacks will be able to arrange its treats on the shelf with a new line of durable treats than without? And there was some information uh, from previous questions that applied to this one. So it told us here that there were three flavors of cat and four flavors of dog treats. Now, this question is hard for a couple of reasons. One, it has to do with some organized counting, and two, the answer choices all have these exclamation points, which if you haven't heard of before, these are called factorials. Now, I'll start with explaining what a factorial is. Something like the exclamation point is called factorial. Five factorial is the same as five times four times three times two times one. Or like seven factorial is the same as seven times six times five times four times three times two times one. So you first of all had to know what factorials are to even attempt solving this question. Now, beyond that, we also have to understand how the ordering works. So if I have, we need to find our additional orders. We need to find the orders now that we have when we add the three treats and the orders originally, the different ways we do it. Now, for these ordering questions, let's go with our new, our ones now. So now there's three different uh, cat treats, four different dog treats, now there's three more durable treats. So there's 10 total ones. Now, if we think of ordering these on a shelf, let's say there's 10 spots on the shelf, the way you can solve these questions, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, and put one at the front, 10. Let's just think how many options we have at each spot. Well, if I'm starting to order myself, uh, I have 10 different treats. That means I have 10 choices for this first spot. Once I put one there, in my second spot, there's only nine choices and then there's only eight choices, and then it goes seven, six, five, four, three, two, and one. To set these up and solve for the total number, it's 10 times nine times eight times seven times six times five times four times three times two times one. We can write this as 10 factorial. Now originally, before we had the new three gerbil treats, there were only seven different things to put on the shelf. So if we set those up, it'd be seven options for the first, then six, five, four, three, two, one, which we can write as seven factorial. The question asks for the additional flavors. So are the additional flavors, the additional orders. So it'd be our 10 factorial minus our seven factorial, which is here, how we'd get to the correct answer of J. Coming up, the fourth most difficult question is going to be question 56 here. So it says the ratio of A to B is five to one, B to C is nine to one. What is the value of two A plus three B? over 4b plus 3c. Now the trick here is we can think of our ratio a to b and b to c. We want the numbers to in some way all match. So currently I have 5 to 1 and then I have 9 to 1. What I want to do is make the b values the same. So I can multiply this whole ratio by 9. So I can write this as 45 to 9 and 9 to 1. Now what I can do is since the middle values match I can compare across ratios. So I can just say a is 45 B is nine and C is one. Now that I have values, I can just plug them in to my equation and solve. So it's gonna be two times 45 plus three times nine divided by four times nine plus three times one. So all I need to do here is basically go ahead and make it easy, use your calculator. Uh, two times A or two times 45 is going to be 90 plus three times 27 is gonna be 117. And then four times nine is going to be 36 plus three is going to be 39. So we can just go to our calculator. You can do 117 divided by 39. It turns out that that equals three. So our answer here is going to be A. Coming at number three on my rankings is number 59 here. So this one says for the real numbers A and B on the number line below where A is less than B, which the following is a possible value of B. Now this one's kind of tricky because we have the square root of A over here is bigger than our value of A over here. Now, usually we're used to the square root being smaller. Let's say if I have something like say the square root of four, the square root of four is two. And that means that our A value normally on the number line would be further right. Like here, if A was four, and root of a equals two, usually we'd see a over here and root a over here, not negative a, sorry, root a. So now how is it gonna be backwards? Well, we can think 
What if instead this has to do with a fraction where it's between zero and one? So as an example, if a equals one half, sorry, not one half, one fourth here, if a equals one fourth, then the square root of a, the square root of one fourth is actually one half. So if a number is somewhere between zero and one, the square root of the number is actually bigger than the number itself. So that means that B, this whole thing has to be less, write that more legibly, less than one. So it can't be negative, because we can't take the negative of square root, that's gonna be imaginary. It can't be positive, it can't be zero, because if B is zero, one is negative, one is positive. So the only option of a possible value of B is going to be answer C here with it being three over seven. And three over seven would work if we had one fourth and one half, it would be somewhere in between. All right, coming in at number two here is question 46. You might notice these aren't all going in order. Sometimes easier questions appear earlier and they're not necessarily the last couple of questions on the test. Usually 45 through 60 is the most difficult, but sometimes again, like question 52 might be easy, but 58 or 59 might be hard. Here, question 46 is one of the hardest. So here it says a portion of the regular polygon, all side lengths of equal, uh, all sides of equal length and all interior angles of equal measure with N sides as shown below. The midpoint of BC is M with the distance uh, from the polygon center R to the midpoint, the same as all sides. And then it says, we're trying to find the area of this whole thing. Okay, so what's going on here? Well, what we see is we're trying to find the area. Now, what we can do is if we can kind of split this into a bunch of triangles, we can basically think the area of the polygon of the whole thing is going to be the area of each triangle times n triangles, because each side, like each of these sides, corresponds to one of those triangles. If I keep drawing, it would be adding one more triangle for each side that we have. So that's kind of the concept here. Now, what we need to do is we need to figure out how to find the area of a triangle. Well, the area of our triangle we know is one half base times height. And here, what we can kind of use is, if this is the midpoint, what we're drawing, this is basically called a perpendicular bisector. It's a little rule that you have to know. So these are actually like right, basically triangles here. So what we can do is we can use a one half base times height. So the base of this whole triangle, AB, or sorry, uh, BCR is a length of BC. So it's one half length BC times height. We can use this altitude, this vertical portion is the height, MR. So that's gonna be the area of our triangle. Now, we said we wanna do the area of each triangle times the number. So I wanna multiply this whole thing by n triangles. I could rewrite this as n over two times BC times MR, which is how here on this really tricky question, we get to F as our correct answer. All right, question 58, we've made it. This is the hardest question in my rankings for the December 2022 ACT math test. Now, this one's really hard for two reasons. One, it uses logarithms, which is a topic a lot of students aren't as comfortable with or confident on. And two, it uses two less commonly tested log rules that many of you may have never learned or have forgotten. So with this one here, it says, let A and B be positive real numbers such that log of A is three, log of B is two. What is the value of log A squared B? Well, the rules we have to know here is Number one is our basically log rule for multiplying. So if you're multiplying logs, we can split this into log of A plus log of B. And the second we have to know is a power rule. So our log power rule is if I have log of let's say A to the B power, we can bring the power to the front. So I can write this as B times log of A. Now. With these guys, those A and Bs don't correspond with the question. Those are just my example equations, but let's actually see how we can simplify this. Well, if I have log A squared B, I can first use my rule here to split this. So I can write my log A squared B as log of A squared plus log of B. Now what I can do is I can use my second rule and bring this to the front. So I can write this as two log A plus log b. Now I know that log of a is three, so I can plug that in for th here for three for log of a, and it's not plus, uh, or not equals plus, my log of b is two, so I can plug in a two. So two times three is six plus two, 
Oops, gives me a value of eight. So our answer here to this tricky question is going to be G. So that takes you guys through the five hardest questions on the test. Now, as far as my reaction to the rest of the test, this is a pretty classic uh, ACT uh, math test. The stuff on the December test was a lot of the topics that you expect to see. Some questions like this were certainly more difficult, but everything on the test was fair game. There was no really kind of weird or obscure questions. It's one that I had a lot of students, I had a couple students get perfect 36s, a lot of students, uh, private tutoring students or students using the ultimate ACT course, a lot of them did very well. Um, if they had put in the time done old practice tests, there was a lot of questions on here that were kind of repeats from previous tests or ones that were super, super similar to old tests. Um, there's also a lot of questions that were just on, uh, you know, classic topics and setups that weren't super hard as long as you had seen the types of questions before and knew what the formulas and rules were to set those up. So as always, looking through these old practice tests, studying those formulas, those rules will help you a lot as you go through. On that, I hope you guys enjoyed this video. Uh, be sure to like the video. If you guys have any different thoughts about which ones you thought were the hardest or if my rankings were all messed up, let me know in the comments below. Uh, otherwise, please follow for lots more ACT content. Other than that, this is Matt at Prep Pro signing off. I'll see you guys next time.